The Cube at EMC World 2014 is brought to you by EMC. Redefine. VCE. Innovating the world's first converged infrastructure solution for private cloud computing. Brocade. Say goodbye to the status quo and hello to Brocade. Hey, welcome back everyone here live in Las Vegas for EMC World 2014. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by my co-host Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org. Our next guest is Brian Doherty, CMA Chief Architect. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much. John. So I got to ask you, what's your impression of all the big news here? Obviously, um, EMC's pretty serious about all flash arrays, don't you think? Oh, nothing but flash. It's been a great <laughs> uh, great experience being here. Flash has is, is truly come of age, and it's, it's the talk of the conference. What about, uh, what about your company? Start, let's start there, yeah. CMA. Tell us about you know, yep. what you guys do and what your role is there. CMA right. is a, we're a hosting data center uh, analytics company. We, we host uh, the largest Medicaid uh, uh, data warehouse and analytics in the country. Uh, we also deliver a products division. We, we deliver rack, Oracle Rack Clusters, uh, a VQ big data product, and uh, we host a lot of different analytics uh, in four different locations around, around the country. So we see hosting analytics. Are you actually monetizing the data, or are you hosting it for clients, or a little bit of both? A little or? bit of both, but primarily hosting it for clients. And, and, uh, and the future is monetizing? That's, the, that's what we're looking at. So that's, a, that's yeah. an interesting discussion yeah. I'm sure you yeah. guys are having oh, uh, yeah. inside the company. What's yeah. the 10 second bumper sticker on that? Is well, we're just trying to figure out what the best way to exploit the technology is and the data that we have right Huge now. opportunity, uh, how do we do it without ticking off everybody? That's and, correct. Yeah. Massive amounts of data, uh, the key is exploiting that data, and that's what we're looking at now. So paint a picture of your IT environment. What, you know, maybe talk about applications and how right. you're serving the business. Right, so we have a very heterogeneous uh, environment. We have a lot of Oracle rack clusters. We have big data clusters. Uh, we have Hadoop running in our environment. We have uh, security infrastructure, Oracle Fusion middleware. We have a suite of analytic apps running. Um, and we get uh, kind of thousands of users coming in every single day and running tens of thousands of queries, uh, different analytic queries, some long running queries, some really short and quick queries. So it's, it's kind of a heterogeneous, complex environment. So of course the big discussion, John and I do a lot of big data events, and a lot of, a lot of Hadoop events, the big discussion there is, is bringing real time to Hadoop. You're hearing a lot about SQL coming into Hadoop yep. to widen the programming yep. you know, skill sets. Um, are you seeing that? You know, what does real time mean to you guys? Real time is becoming to mean to us uh, less than one millisecond, uh, microsecond. Um, and it's becoming a kind of a competitive strategic advantage. Um, it's no longer okay to have an analytics environment where people can run a query and wait you know, five seconds for the response. We now have applications that are intercepting from devices, not only people now, and it requires immediate response time, microsecond response time, and it's just becoming a more complex environment. And so obviously Flash fits into this discussion Flash. very nicely. What's your experience with Flash? When did it, when did it start? Take us back to the beginning. Uh, about 15 months ago, we started looking at different Flash products. Uh, we had uh, ultra latency, uh, ultra low latency application needs and requirements. Uh, we, we looked at several products on the market and uh, stumbled along uh, Extreme IO, across Extreme IO, um, liked what we saw. Uh, continue to test with it uh, for, for several months. Um, and we've been there ever since. Um, through the purchase, through the acquisition, and uh, just continue to see value add in the product, pleased with the product, and we're kind of looking at the product a little bit differently today also. Some of the use cases you're seeing out there that possibly that are now possible with it, I mean, we're talking snapshots, everyone used to snapshots, yep. databases yep. are now, tsunami of data is yep. killer. With every new technology, there's always new experiences. Right. User experiences, outcomes. What are you seeing as an architect that, that you're going for, and how do you build an architecture for potentially unknown opportunities? Right, so there were a couple reasons, a couple things that are exciting to us. One is, uh, we have an Oracle Rack Accelerator product, and we were having a very difficult time getting the IO throughput that we needed. Uh, it's a Linux rack-based cluster, and then we'd plug a VMAX or a very large storage array in the back end and then ship it to a customer and plug it in. Well, that becomes a very difficult thing to do. So we were looking at a much smaller form factor, something would fit into a 42U rack that had the power that a large scale array had that we could quickly deploy and deliver. So one of the reasons we looked at this early on and very excited is we could, we could essentially uh, shrink wrap 
uh, our clusters with the I.O. power and capability that we had in a large array, and that was a critical thing for us, crucial thing for us to do. What so about, um, you mentioned that sort of example where you, you, you sort of struggled to do this with the, with the, with the VMAX, yeah, and then, right. but what about the stack? Um, you know, because VMAX you trust, right? It's got oh, all yeah. this hardened software, it's right. got you know, two decades of right. testing and right. everything else. Did that make you nervous, or is it the type of workload that didn't make you nervous because you it really focused on opportunities? And how did you rationalize it? Yeah, anyone that? would be kidding if they said it didn't make them nervous to move off of VMAX and to another <laughs> a newer platform. I That's mean, good. But one of the things we that, that is pleasing to us, and one of the reasons we're with Extreme IO is, is the reputation of EMC. Uh, you know, we know EMC. We know EMC has value, has great research and development, great service, and that was one of the things that, that was very, very uh, compelling to us up front. Um, and uh, we saw the performance that we could get Extreme IO, the scale out performance. Uh, so we knew that we were not going to tap out the performance that we had. So yeah, so it was scary up front a little bit, but uh, we knew EMC was backing it. We knew they had great technology, great engineers, and uh, you know we've grown to, tr to trust it just like a VMAX. And how would you characterize the state of the sort of Extreme IO stack? Would you would you say that it's? I mean, obviously it's not as mature it's, as a VMAX. No. But it's, but where is it at? I think two things. It's uh, from the from the time we first started using uh, Extreme IO, we were looking at performance, performance, performance. That was a crucial thing for us. But lately, in the last couple of months, we've grown to look at some of the more of the value add features that are there. You mentioned snapshots. Snapshots are a crucial thing for us going forward because uh, we struggle right now. We may have 50 development projects going on at any given point in time. We have sets of developers. We have QA and test. It's very difficult for us to support. Uh, five to ten different images of the of the pr production database, and to serve that out to the different development groups that are there. With snapshots, we can now do that easily and quickly, and we don't have to compromise performance. We don't have to compromise uh, latency. We can let a developer, a QA tester, run on an environment that is essentially a production environment. What if we could talk about that a little bit? So, so a lot of people complain about copy creep. It gets expensive, um, but you're telling a different story. Uh, Why? Help us double click on that well, a little bit. Well, it's the metadata and it's the value add of the operating system itself. Um, you know, with Extreme IO, it's possible to leverage a smaller set of core flash data and to essentially multiply or project that very efficiently out to a heterogeneous group of users and environments. Uh, in the past, you can do that, but it takes long and it is a higher overhead, uh, higher overhead uh, operation. So this is very efficient, low overhead, and we can exploit this to many different groups at the same time. So you're a big Oracle shop. Yep. Um, one of the things that we've looked at at Wikibon is the impact of bringing in uh, more flash into the environment, optimizing the storage infrastructure, actually maybe spending a little bit more on flash, and then reducing the number of cores that uh -huh. we may require because yep. Oracle Yep. Oracle license and maintenance costs are based on, well, it's license costs yeah. based on cores. Yep, yep. And oftentimes it's 50 plus percent of an overall yep. total cost of ownership. Yep. Are you seeing that in your environment? That's another big thing, big thing for us. Uh, we're seeing three things along that line. We're seeing an ability to shift from a larger and a more expensive hardware platform to a smaller x86 based hardware platform, mm -hmm. get the same performance. We're seeing uh, the ability to exploit the processing core more because of the reduction in the latency off the drive itself. So we can shift to smaller hardware, get better utilization, reduce the core set, and we're benefiting from the ability to, for essentially it's uh, half the cost on the Linux platform versus a, for example, an AX platform for the Oracle costs. So really three things that drive costs down for us. The shift to x86, the reduction in the hardware cost, and the exploitation, the higher utilization of the core count that's there. Okay, and, and and so, but not yet reducing license and maintenance costs. Is that a future? Well, or? no, that we're doing that right now also. I mean, that's because we're we're able to reduce that core count competently. Right, because so it's we have the power right in the back end. Yeah. It comes right through. So, uh, but it's not just that core count reduction. There's there's all three of those things really, really, uh, you know, really lead us to a great environment in, in yep. combination. Yep. How about um, there's a lot of talk about data scientists and yep. you know the new rock star and shortage of data scientists. Um, what are you guys doing in the world of data scientists? You're hiring data scientists, you're training data scientists, is it a, a key part of your organization? What's, what's happening, uh, what we're seeing a lot of is uh, kind of a retrofitting of uh, analysts, mm. scientists, PhDs in our environment, 
that were using older technology and now we're kind of redirecting them to the newer technology that we have. So some of it is moving from, for example, from something like SAS to R. Um, uh, so they're, you know, different software that's there, moving to Hadoop platforms, uh, and just the power and the speed of Flash and some of the other technologies, they're able to iterate much more quickly through the data. Uh, you know, not run a query, wait for three hours, then run a query again, but actually run a query 15 to 20 times within a five minute span. Where in your Hadoop infrastructure are you actually applying Flash? Are you using Hadoop as a filter and then running the you know, real-time analysis on, right. the, on the nuggets that you extract and that's where the Flash is? Or do you see that, that, that real-timeness getting into Hadoop and the Flash actually permeating into that infrastructure over time? Well, we're using, actually, most of the time we're using Flash in the Hadoop environment. We, we may have Hadoop on some different storage, but right. we have the high-performance in-memory databases or the high-performance MPP databases uh, sitting on the Flash itself. So mm -hmm. it's really uh, kind of a, uh, a mixed environment where some of the core Hadoop is running on kind of a little bit maybe internal slower disk, but the in-memory databases, the whole stack, the, the database part of the stack is running on the Flash. Right. And so what's Apple Gemfire may be running on Flash. Sure, okay. Right? Yeah. So what's your take on, uh, on the whole NoSQL trend? Um, do you see that being part of your portfolio in, in the future, what or is it already today? What people forget sometimes, I think, is that uh, you know, the industry spent 30 to 40 years developing optimizer technology. So you just don't develop optimizer technology overnight. So there's a lot of things you can replace in that relation environment but 30 years of optimizer technology is not something you can replace. So some things will be fine with NoSQL, some things will be fine for kind of lightweight SQL, but some things are going to continue to require that optimizer depth and, and that will continue to stay in the MPP, the in-memory databases or, or the Oracle databases. So I could say, okay, so it's fair to say you've looked at it. Yep. Um, you're not deploying it today. We're, de we're, we're judiciously deploying it. Okay. So, um, Where's a good fit for it, for no uh, Something quick and dirty that doesn't require a lot of elegance and complexity in the query path. Okay. So kind of sifting through data quickly, taking a quick, broad look at it, and then maybe at that point you may load it into a, a database, relational database, an MPP database, to do more in-depth mining and analytics. But, but there's a lot of scrubbing, a lot of screening, there's massive amounts of data, so it, it's, it's a quite a, it can be a good tool to kind of uh, pre-qualify data before you go further down that path. Brian, what role does visualization play in all this and how are you visualizing all this data and, and turning you know, data into insights? Yeah, one of the most uh, difficult things for us is to uh, go through 100 terabytes of data and then to pick out the, you know, the 15 kilobytes that, that makes sense. <laughs> so you have so much noise in the system but you, yet you need to get to the value out of the data. So we're, we're drowning in data flowing in but we're having a very difficult time to sift through that. So there are some good visualization technologies um, that can be employed to do that, uh, but there's still a long way. I, I think there's still some work to do in that environment, and we're still struggling with it ourselves. All right, Brian, John, extracting the signal from the noise. <laughs> Brian <laughs> Doherty here inside the Cube. We are rocking and rolling. Three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Not one Cube operation, but two Cube double barrel shotgun of thought leadership. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back after this short break.